I know that you are in the house of God and I know that the Lord will bless you, honor you, lift you up because you have come with great expectation. And whenever you come into the house of God with great expectation, He always meets you at the point of your needs. And uh, it is His will to bless you. It is His will to honor you. It is with His will that He will see you encouraged, prosperous, and be in health, in strength, in vigor and vitality. It is His will that you will lack no good thing in your life. You know, that's the will of the Heavenly Father and we want to really thank God for that. And therefore, you're welcome to the Amazing Grace Miracle Mondays meeting. And uh, in this church, Jesus loves you the most. I did not die for your sins, but Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God, died for you on the cross of Calvary, paid the price for you, that you will not have to carry that burden any longer in your life, that your life will be set free. He has paid the price for your sin. He has paid the price for the penalty that you and I were supposed to pay. God paid it for us. You know, that's why the Bible says in the book of John chapter 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's a very powerful statement that's there in the book of John. It's the Word of God. He loved us so much. You know, that's the Father's love. And therefore, we Christians, we call our, our God the Father in Heaven. And we are so grateful for the relationship. Christianity is all about relationship. It's relationship with God the Father. It's relationship with the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture says in the book of John chapter 8 verse 32, You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. These are Jesus' words. Jesus also said in the book of John chapter 10 verse 10, That the thief comes to steal, but to kill and to destroy. But I have come to give you life and life more in abundance. And I like the promises of what Jesus had made to his children and to his people. So when we desire to know the truth, you know, there is a desire that is also created by God. You know, there is a thirst that God puts into our hearts. There is a hunger in our soul that God creates within us so that we are hungry for His presence. We are hungry for His word. We are hungry and thirsty so that the Lord is going to meet us at the point of our needs. And you know what happens is there are times that we go through a rough patch. There are times that we go through difficulties. There are times that we go through the valley experiences. There are times that we go through the tunnels of life. But the word always promises that at the end of the tunnel, there is always the light. You know, there is always hope at the end of the tunnel. You know, if today you are sick, it is not necessary that you will always be sick. If today you are looking for a miracle, it's not necessary that today God cannot answer you for your miracles. Amen? You know, if today you are in need of finances, it is it is very important for us to understand that if we will believe, we will also receive because God says when you come to me, believe in me and you will also receive of me. Because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, 6, it says that he who comes to me must believe that he is and he is the rewarder of them, those who the gently seek him. That's the promise of his word and God desires that we will all be blessed beyond measure. So this evening, be alert to what the Lord has to say to you and I promise you that the, you will be met at the point of your need. Your need needs will be met, your wants will be fulfilled, your desires will be accomplished and the dreams and the vision that you have ever had in God will also be realized in the mighty name of Jesus. Because my God is a God of war. Amen. What is it? My God is a God of war. Say my God is a God of war. You know my God fights my battles. My God wages war on my behalf. My God fights the battles for me. There may be a big war but there are many battles to it. And, for, and so it's, if you see from the beginning to the end, my God has already seen the victory for you and for me. Amen. You know, He knows the end before the beginning. And that's how powerful our God is. He knows our end before our beginning. Even, when, even before we were born, even before we were conceived in our mother's womb, He knew us. And He had, the Bible says that He has predestined us and foreordained us before the creation of this world to be His inheritance. That means to be His sons, to be His daughters. And that is an awesome relationship that God wants to establish and He desires that we all will have that relationship with God the Father. That the relationship that was broken with him in the Garden of Eden by sin, by one man Adam, through the second man and the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, we will have life and life in abundance because the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, obeyed the word of God and through him came the blessings of God over our lives. So tonight, my question to you is, do you believe in creative miracles? Yes, I do. Okay, a few of them. 
Okay, if you don't believe, and I promise you'll start believing because as we start singing to the Word of God, you will also know what the Word of God says because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more you hear of God's Word, the more faith arises. The moment your faith arises, it is, you know, and it is ripe and ready. It touches the very throne room of God and it brings in your miracle and your, and your blessings and the healings and the deliverances or the answers to your prayer that you're waiting for will be received in the mighty name of Jesus. So tonight I'm going to share with you from the from a couple of uh, instances in the Bible and uh, these are the live recordings of Jesus's miracles and it says you know uh, there was a uh, and, and I took a passage from the blind men by Jesus who were who were healed by the Lord Jesus Christ and there are four occasions in the Gospels that Jesus healed the blind men the first occasion is in the book of Matthew chapter 9 verses 27 to 31 if you have your Bibles you can see it if you don't have your Bible it will be up on your screen that you can see to the word it says in Matthew 9, 27 to 31. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to, came, men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? You know, Jesus always asks the question. Whenever Jesus puts forth a question, we better be able to respond accurately and correctly. And so these men were in need. What was the need? They were blind men. Their two men were blind men. And they came unto Jesus and they were crying unto the Lord. What they were saying, O son of David, O son of David, have mercy on us. Now mind you, there were two men. And these two men were not asking in, in, in solitude. They came together in unison. And there is power in the prayer of unity. There is power in the prayer of agreement. And they did not say, Lord, you heal me. You know, one was not saying, I will receive my healing. I don't care if you are healed or not. They were similar in the same position, in the same boat. They were both blind and they wanted the healing together. You know, and it's, there is something so powerful about the corporate faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so powerful when we have a collective faith in the Lord God Almighty. We can be sometimes together in the same boat. Probably you are having a financial difficulty. There is somebody else within the church and within the body of Christ also having a similar difficulty that you are facing. And if so, suppose you get to know that Lord not only have mercy on me but also have mercy on my brother. Also have mercy on my sister. And let me tell you a power of agreement and the power of the unity of prayer will bring forth a mighty miracle that takes place. And so these men said, Oh, son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, that means Jesus went to visit somebody. You know, Jesus was a good shepherd. He also went and visited people. He went and had some chai, some dawa, you know, some masala tea, some neoma choma, some, you know, bansin and all those things. That, you know, chicken biryani, mutton biryani, and you know, manir pakhani, paneer makhani, and all those things he had. You know, it's time for dinner and I'm hungry now. All right. So that Jesus visited and he was having probably some tea, the Middle Eastern tea or Middle Eastern gava. And he went to visit them that house and these blind men followed Jesus. Now imagine these blind men had no guide. These blind men only followed the footsteps of Christ with their sticks probably. They knew that the crowd was going. They knew where Jesus was there. Probably they heard the hearing was very alert and they knew where Jesus was going. Can you imagine? Blind men can follow Jesus and today many Christians whose eyes are open cannot follow Jesus. And then that's the biggest challenge. You know, these blind men, because they were in need, they were willing to follow Jesus and they were willing to go to that home where Jesus was having tea. And then they came into that house with their blindness. They came in and they were willing to receive and willing to have a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible records, Jesus saith unto them. You know, Jesus always sees people in need. Jesus doesn't say, praise Lord to the one who has got a very nice coat who is wearing and a nice gold ring on his finger. But Jesus is willing to meet the need of the people who are blind and who are poor and who are needy. And that's why I like my Jesus. Hallelujah. Because he never despises the poor people. He never despises the needy people. And whenever people come in needs and they are encountered and they are oppressed and afflicted by the enemy, he always has compassion and he will always take time to greet them. He will always take time to meet with them. Amen? I like my Jesus. Do you like your Jesus? Amen. So do, would you like to meet the blind man on the way or when they come to your church? Instead of meeting your own, uh, you know, cliquish people. You know, there are some cliques in the church. You know? You'll only meet your group. you only meet this kind of group. That's our group. That's our And that's our hello, hi, praise Lord. And that's it. And you go away. Have you taken time to meet those blind people who have walked into your congregation? 
Have you taken time when those people who came for they were needy and hungry, you took some time off and offered them tea and gave them snacks after the church service? Is a question that we need to ask. Are we following the footsteps of Jesus and meeting the ones who came with needs in the house of God? And these men, the blind men, came with a need in their hearts. And what was the need? Lord, open my eyes. And so they said what something Jesus said. Believe me that I am able to do this. I like the questions of Jesus. Do you believe that I can do this miracle? Do you believe that I can open your eyes? Do you believe that I can meet you at the point of your need? That is the question that Jesus is asking these blind men. And mind you, these blind men never had the reading of the Torah. They never had the, the Jewish tradition. They never understood the power of the word. These blind men were probably the outcast. These blind men were probably the beggars on the street. And they had no opportunity to dine in and to come into the synagogue because these Sadducees and Pharisees would not pay attention to this kind of people who are of beggarly elements. Are you with me? And so what Jesus said, do you believe that I can do this miracle? And I like that. You know, I like that. That Jesus was not only, you know, Jesus always met the needs of people. And I see in the Gospels that he met most of the time the poor people's needs. Majority of the miracles were done among the poor people. It's not that he has not done miracles with the rich people. He also did the uh, miracles with the rich people. You know, the rich man, you know, the centurion, you know, healed the sick. The daughter was raised from the dead. He did many miracles among the rich and the ruler and the people who have dominions. But he had heart was with the needy. His heart with the hungry and with the poor people who were like without shepherds. And they had no place to go. And so Jesus said, do you believe that I can do that? And they said unto him, I like that corporate re response. You know, so sometimes I say, Amen, do you believe that one or two persons say, you know, there's no corporate response. You know, Jesus could not do mighty works in his own hometown because of their unbelief, the Bible says. You know, barring that he laid hands on some sick people and they were healed. The back aches and the headaches went away, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But no creative miracles took place in his hometown. Jesus could not do mighty miracles in his hometown. The Bible records why? Because of their unbelief. They said, hey, we have seen this child grow up in our midst. We know that he is a carpenter's Joseph's son. And we know his brothers and sisters. What is he going to talk about and what miracles he is going to do? Are you with me? So sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. And that saying, the English idiom is quite right. Familiarity breeds contempt. And the Bible also talks about the spirit of familiarity. You know, sometimes we become so familiar with God and we become so bumptum with God that we stop reverencing God, stop respecting God, stop honoring God, and stop doing the thing that God has called us to do that meet the people at the point of their needs. And tonight let me encourage you that Jesus is here to meet you at the point of your needs. This meeting is specially organized that your needs will be met. This meeting is specially organized and it is themed as Miracle Mondays that we believe that Jesus' presence is here so that he can meet you at the point of your needs and you will not go the same the way you entered into this auditorium. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the Lord. Right? So what does it say? It says that, believe me that I am able to do this, said unto him, yes Lord. Then he touched he their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. I like that word. Jesus said, it's not in accordance to my power to heal. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He has all the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating. He's got all the power and the fruits of the Holy Ghost manifesting. But he did not take the glory to his name. He did not say that I have healed you. He said it is your faith that has obtained the healing for you. It is your faith that has caused the miracle of open eyes for you. That's what he's saying. According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were open. I like that. You know? And Jesus straightly each out them saying, See that no man know it, but they when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. What happened to these three people? These two people never knew the Torah. These two people only had one encounter with God. And that encounter God with God that they couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see Jesus with their eyes. But they believed in Jesus. When they heard through the years that Jesus is doing mighty miracles. They believed in Jesus. And they were willing to meet with Jesus. So that the miracle can be obtained. But Jesus said, I am not going to do the miracle. It is your faith. If you have the faith, you will receive your miracle. There's another second instance that Jesus did a miracle. And again with the blind people. In Matthew chapter 20 verse 30 to 34. And behold two blind men sitting by the wayside. When they heard that Jesus passed by. Cried out saying. Have mercy on us O Lord. Thou son of David. 
You know, that's what they were saying. They were crying out. Similar, similar situation. But these two men were sitting on the wayside. They were beggars. They had a bowl probably before them. They had their earnings on an everyday basis. If some passerby would drop a coin so that their needs could be met. But when they heard that Jesus was doing miracles, when they heard, when they could smell it, when they could hear it, that Jesus was passing and the big crowd is passing, they started to scream aloud, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. I like that. Hmm? Again, there is a prayer of unity. Again, there is a prayer of agreement. Again, they believe together. Again, they believe. You know, that's so powerful and they only do. And there is the power of two when you see in the Bible, right from the beginning, when Jesus sent his disciples, he sent them two by two. You know, when God meant a united man, there were two became one. And it's so awesome because when two are together and they become one and their voice becomes one, the sound of the prayer becomes one. A miracle is in the making. Yeah. Hallelujah. A miracle is in the making when you believe together. Amen. When you agree together, the Lord, we are the beggars now. We are seated on the, on the wayside. The Lord have mercy upon us and open our eyes. You know, they cried out, have mercy on us, O Lord, the son of David. And the multitude rebuked them. Can you imagine? Two voices against the multitude of voices. Their voices were drowned. What the multitudes were doing? Hey, shun, shun your voices. Today you may be in need, today you may be crying, but the multitude wants to rejoice. The multitude wants to have a joyous party with Jesus. They want to have barbecue party with Jesus. They want to have the good things from Jesus. They don't want you and your voice to come to the very throne room of God. That's what the multitudes do. Are you with me? But they did not give up hope. They did not give up hope. They cried out louder, the Bible says. Right? And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold the peace. But they cried the more saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord. Wow. Hallelujah. Come on. You know, when we start crying out, the Bible says, Open your mouth wide, wide, and I will fill it. That means you will cry out unto the Lord, and He is going to fill him, fill you with His Holy Ghost. He's going to fill you with His manna, the true word of God. He's going to fill you with the very precious word that brings life unto you. Hallelujah. So these men did what? They did not pay attention to the cry of the multitude. They did not, they were not discouraged. They said, hey man, there is majority, there are thousands of people, there are hundreds of people following Jesus. They are all shutting us down. And I believe there are many people seated tonight that you were shut down in your relationship. They were, you were rebuked down. You were made to be silent in your relationship. And you were not allowed to cry out unto your God or unto your people so that your voice will not be heard. But let me tell you, even though they would have tried to shun your voice, my God still has the ears to hear your cry. Amen. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter who has tried to reject you. It doesn't matter who has tried to subdue your voice. It doesn't matter who's tried to humiliate you or to tramp you under their feet. It does not matter what the masses say, but it does matter your faith that cries out in spite of, of what the cry of the masses is. Because the prayer of need is what touches the very realm of Jesus' God. Is a prayer of need is what touches the very compassions of Jesus and causes a miracle to be in the making. That's what God does. And that's what happens when you cry out unto the Lord. And they said, they cried out more saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still. I like that word. What it says that Jesus stood still. Come on. Jesus. Say Jesus stood still. Hmm? When Jesus stands still, I promise you, the miracle is about to take place. Amen. And right now I see in my spiritual life that Jesus' presence is standing still just next to you. Amen. Just to meet you at that very specific need that probably may not be the another need of somebody else in the body of Christ, but it is individual to you. And he's touching you right now, wherever you are. Receive his touch. Receive his. He's standing still next to you. Huh? And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will you that I shall do unto you? Again a question. Again a question. Same scenario. Two blind men, two blind men. Same prayer. They cried out in together in unison. These people are trying also crying out together in unison. And but a second, a different question that Jesus says. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will you that I shall do unto you? Don't you think that Jesus knew their need? It was very physically evident that they were blind. They were beggars. 
They want prosperity. They wanted healing. But Jesus wants to do a specific miracle for you. And that's why he asks you a question, what shall I do for you? You know, we don't know what these blind men's needs were. Jesus knew what these blind men's needs were, but he wanted to be very specific whilst performing the miracle for them. Or doing something that was beyond man's understanding. You know, and therefore Jesus sometimes stands still and asks you a question, what can I do for you, my son? What can I do for you, my daughter, tonight for you? Can I wipe away your tears? Can I heal your sick body? You know, and he may not ask, but he asks you a question. Yeah? You know, they could have said, Lord, you know, we are beggars right from our, you know, days when we are growing up. We are sitting on the wayside and somebody drops a coin. They could have asked for financial prosperity. And God would have given them financial prosperity, but without eyes. Think about it. So Jesus asked a very, very specific question. They were poor. They were beggars. They were sitting on the wayside. They also had a need of finances. But the greater need was not financial, but the greatest need was that they can see. They can see with their eyes. And so they cried out and said, they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. Say, our eyes may be open, the Lord. So Jesus had compassion on them. Like that. What did Jesus have? He had compassion. I like my Jesus. You know, the moment they mentioned their need, Jesus was moved with compassion and he said that Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. See the response? They cried unto the Lord, their need was met and what they did? Did they go back rejoicing, partying? Hey, my eyes are open, brothers come and I'll make some biryani for you and you know we'll share together, bring some Coca-Cola in my house and we will have a party tonight because now I can see hallelujah. No, they were having a different kind of party. You can have a real good party when you are in the presence of the Almighty. Amen. Right? That's a real party that you can have. Because in His presence, every need is met. It is whether your hunger or whether your thirst or a financial need or a material need or a marital need or an emotional need or a financial need. It is all met in the very presence of the Almighty God. And they received the sight and they followed Him. I like my Jesus. Right? What did they, the first two blind men, what did they do? They spread the gospel of Jesus. They became evangelists. The second blind man followed him. They became disciples. When your need is met tonight, when you are healed in your body, when your life is saved from sin, and your darkness has been broken, and the bondages and the shackles have been destroyed, are you following Jesus? Is the question that we sometimes need to ask. When God has blessed you with abundance, when God has poured his and opened the floodgates of heaven and poured out a blessing on you, are you worshipping Jesus? Is a question that we need to ask. The secret for you to receive and the secret for you to maintain your miracle and your healing or your blessing is to keep following him, keep worshipping him, keep praising him, keep praying him and keep fellowshipping with him. That's where your maintenance of your miracle will remain. Amen? Amen. Because a lot of people, they make their blessing and they run away. And they again come back, Pastor, you know, I got my healing that day, but again I've got the same problem. But the problem has increased more because I do not know what happened. Because, you know, after receiving a miracle, you disappeared. You were not there. You were saved. You were healed. You were delivered. You were not there. I don't know what happened to you. Right? You, many people come to us and say, Pastor, pray for a job. We pray for the job and they get a job. After the job, they become so busy that they cannot show in the house of God and they stop following Jesus. They say, Pastor, you know, job has kept us so busy. Then probably I should say that the Lord should take away your job so that you can come back to the house of God and worship. Are you with me? Right? No, no, Pastor, why? Why? Because your job is keeping you so occupied that you are not stop crying unto the Lord. Earlier you were blind, earlier you were without a job, but today when you have God has opened your eyes and God has blessed you with a job and God has blessed you with finances, you have forgotten the house of God. No, these men, one became, the two became evangelists and the other two became the disciples. They immediately followed Jesus. There was no waiting. Immediately. Immediately. When God does a miracle, immediately follow Him. Immediately obey His commandment. And the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 1 and 18 and 19, it says in verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, what you do? You will enjoy the good of the land. And I like what Jesus says, what God's word says. Right? And so what happened? Immediately they followed Him. The third instance, Mark 8, 22 to 26. 
The third instance. And he came to Bethsaida and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. See, he was a paralytic blind man. And he came to Bethsaida and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, wow, what kind of Jesus do you serve? He also spits on people? Yes. Even in the spirit of Jesus, there is power. Hallelujah. Even in the breath of Jesus, there is power. Because when Jesus was making Adam in the Garden of Eden, he did not even spit on him. He just made a clay and breathed on him and he became a living being. Isn't that powerful? I like my Jesus. So don't worry about the spirit of Jesus. Right? Even in the spirit of Jesus, there is anointing. Even in the spirit of Jesus, there is power. There is glory hidden in the very, a very, very spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a very, very weird form of healing a sick man. Right? Suppose you come to and I spit at you. You say, you know, you talk to people and say, what this pastor is a spitting pastor. You know, he's spitting on people and he's trying to heal the sick. Hey man, he's a weird pastor. I don't want to go there. But why Jesus stand on him? Hallelujah. And so... And so what happened? And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And so what happened? When he spat on him, he saw partially. And after that, he put his hand on him, he could see fully. See the power of spitting and the laying on of hands. Amen? There's a combination of spitting and the laying on of hands. On spitting, there was partial healing. On laying on of hands, there was 100% healing. So are you ready to receive the Spirit of God upon your life tonight? But really the true disciples will say amen. The newcomers will be very difficult and very weird for you. I can understand with you. I said, what God you're talking about? You're God's person. You know, it's very, very, you know, weird the story pastor. You're telling me from the Bible. But that's the reality. That's what happened. And there is a serious, you know, uh, uh, thing hidden behind it. And he looked up and said, I, mean, I see men as trees walking. What is looking at men? As trees walking. Can you imagine this man has never seen in life? And then he sees, you know, he's thought, he has heard that trees always eat, they never move. But they say he looks like all these trees are walking. Can you imagine that vision? Have you ever had a vision that, you know, men are walking like trees? Huh? And then he says, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly and sent him away in his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any man in the town. But this man also went around and spread the gospel of Jesus. Hmm? Very clearly Jesus said, don't talk about it. Then there's a very, this, this is... This is the ultimate in opening blind eyes. If you want to specialize in opening blind eyes, then see and study the, how Jesus opened the blind eyes. Right? First he asked the faith levels. Secondly, again he asked for the faith levels. And thirdly, he put the spit on him. He didn't ask for the faith levels. Third and you know, fourthly, he does something. John chapter 9, 1 to 7. This is the ultimate of how Jesus opens a blind eye. You know, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. He was blind from it, from his birth. And his disciple asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, a lot of time today when we are facing agony, facing, you know, sicknesses and disease and financial troubles, immediately our mind goes to the negative. But have I sinned? Have my parents sinned? Is there some generation? There's some ministries who are only breaking generation curses, constantly. You know, yeah, there can be generation curses. But the moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are water baptized, every generational curse has been broken. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen? There is no generational curse can stay behind and upon you. Yes, there are generational curses. Because if your forefathers were idol worshippers, your forefathers were pagans, and they never knew how to worship the true living God, because the Bible says in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship Him should worship Him in spirit and truth. He's looking for worshippers who will worship Him in spirit and truth. And Jesus is the spirit, and Jesus is the truth. And we need to worship Him in the human spirit and in the knowing, of, in the knowledge of the truth that Jesus is the truth and we worship the true Savior. And that's what God desires. So there could be a possibility that there is a generational lineage of curses. But the moment you are born again, the moment you walk into the waters of baptism, every curse is cancelled and you become a brand new person. Hallelujah. You are positioned to receive every blessing that God has poured upon Abraham. And Abraham was blessed with cattle, with gold and with silver. I like Abraham's. 
Right? So the moment you're baptized, what happens? It positions you to receive every blessing. And so the question was asked by whom? By his disciples. And mind you, Jesus, his disciples were the disciples of the, you know, school of old thought. Because they believed, you know, the Jewish people believed that if a man is born, his age is not counted from the day he is born, but that nine months in the mother's womb is also counted in Jewish calendar of the birth. Because they believe that from the moment of conception, you know, your life has started. And when the life has started, you know, that add those nine months of your history in that. So if, if you are today 40 years old, add another nine months more to your age. That's how the Jewish people calculate, you know, their age. So they understood that. They understood that it probably their parents have sinned because they knew the word, they knew the word of Exodus. They knew the Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 10, 20, 10 onwards. And said, you know, if your forefathers have sinned, the curses will come upon four generations. So they were asking a very valid question, which was right in the right in the sight of the law. And they asked that question from the Creator, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. You know, a lot of people sometimes, you know, you know, amongst us, the people who are born with uh, handicaps, born with, you know, without a brain, without, you know, so many things, without ears, without eardrums, without heart, or holes in heart, you know, without one kidney, two kidneys, you know, whatever, as many kidneys you want today, you can get it in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Right? That's what God is willing to do. He's willing to meet you at the point of your need. It doesn't matter whether you have or not. It does matter but Jesus is willing to give you one more. Uh, Jesus has restored that back, that organ to you that is probably missing ever since you were born. And I promise you that if you are going to pay attention to what God is saying, you will be healed and delivered. You will have that organ come back to place in the name of Jesus. And there will be a creative miracle. So what he said? Jesus answered. I like that, what Jesus answered. He never, never, ever, you know, ever gets hooked on to the negative things. I like my Jesus. You know, he's very positive. My Jesus is very positive. He always looks to the good in a man. He always looks to the possibility of a miracle. He always looks to how healing can be done. He can always, he's looking for an opportunity that he can perform the magnificence and, and display the, the majesty of God in the person's life. He's not delving in the past. Oh, he's trying to, you know, there are so many people pray, I'll pray and get back to you. Brother, you have sinned now, some, there's some witchcraft upon you. Your forefather had sinned and he's gone into the grave. He did some witchcraft and something is like that. People are so deaf into those past things. No, oh, my Jesus is not. And my Jesus answers a very, very beautiful answer. And he says, neither have this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I like my Jesus. But the works of God should be made manifest in him. If you see a challenge of that nature, are you moved with a challenge and to give the right answer that God can do a miracle? And Jesus did not say, I will do a miracle. Jesus said that the works of God should be made manifest in him. You know, Jesus was always careful giving glory to God. Jesus was always careful giving glory to the Father because he knew when the Father is doing a miracle, that miracle will be done for you. Amen? Yes. And so that's what Jesus was doing. And he said, I must work. Then he said, I must work the works of him that sent me. Whose work is that? The Father's work. See Jesus, how he's saying? He's saying, this is not my church. This is not my ministry. This is not my thing. This is my Father's work. It is him who has sent me. And I am here to fulfill his command in my life. I will do and manifest the works that God has sent me to do. I will be very diligent in doing what he has called me to do. And then he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And here, what he does, he displays and reveals his one attribute of his character. God is love, but he's saying, he's God, he's light. God is light. I am the light of the world. There is no other light. Are you with me? Mm. I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus said in 14. says, I am the way. He did not say, I am one of the ways. He did not say, I may be one of the ways. He did not say, I might be the way. He said, I am one of the ways. No. He said, I am the way. That means there is no other option. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's why again Jesus was talking the same thing here. 
And then Jesus said something. Hmm? When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Again he spits. But now not on the man, but on the ground. The spirit of Christ meeting the earth is about to create something very powerful in this man's life. Now mind you, Jesus is using the earth. Jesus did not use somebody's eye transplant. Jesus did not say, okay, brother, uh, Luke, Dr. Luke, give me some eye, you know, some dead man has gone and he has given the eye donation and, you know, take that eye that is preserved and kept in some distilled water and fix it in this man. No. And, and then I will lay my hands and pray and a miracle will happen and the eyes will get set. No, 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 no. My Jesus was not doing that. Jesus is the creator of the light. Are you with me? And he took the very essential ingredients to manufacture the eyes in this blind man's sockets that was actually empty and there were only holes. So what Jesus did, he spat on the ground and he mixed the clay and he took the clay and anointed that man or applied that clay on that man's sockets. I like that. What Jesus did? Jesus took the clay through which you and I have been made. Right? Dust are we and to dust we return. Yes. That's what happens. When you die, what happens? People yes. take some dust and... Right? You are buried in six feet by three down in the grave. And they all sound, they say some... They, 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 the people who have never given you flowers, they also put flowers on you. You never know. You know. <laughs> they put flowers there. So when it is the right time to give flowers, give flowers to your spouses now. Then you are alive. Not on the, you know, burial time. Right? So when there is, you know, a death, you know, there are so many flowers. In the whole lifetime, you have not given a flowers to your wife or to your husband or to your children. Give flowers. No problems when the person is alive. Right? Okay. So what happened here? Jesus did what? He took the clay and of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him something. You see, there is a process here. What has happened here? There is a process that Jesus is doing. That Jesus is taking the earth, he spat on the ground, he mixed the earth with his pillow and placed the clay on the man's eyes. What he did? He placed the clay on the man's eyes and then he gave a command. What was the command? Go wash in the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam is called the pool of the sent one. Are you with me? You know, there are times when Jesus will do a partial work and then he will expect you to complete the work. Are you with me? That means he has done the work, but he's waiting for your obedience for the miracle to happen. That means if you will obey his word and go to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes and wash that mud that has been put into your eyes sockets, you have to believe for that to happen. Right? And so what happened here? The Bible says, you know, this man, he went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. He came back seeing. Isn't that amazing? You know, there are many occasions that God has touched you. That God's anointing has come upon you. That God's clay and the spittle has come upon that particular area of your life. But God expects you to do something. Go to the pool. Go to the waters of Siloam. And wash yourself. And wash yourself. And put that water into your eyes. And there is something that is going to happen. This man came back saying. What happened to this man? He was born blind. But now new organs have been created. By the miracle that Jesus has done. And that was a miracle that happened in combination. And in, in a united effort of two people. It was God and the man. And let me tell you that tonight, most of your miracles are waiting in tandem. A lot of miracles you receive when you come as a person who doesn't know God. That happens to you all of a sudden. But most of the time for Christians today, probably you were born in a Jewish home, probably you were born in an Israelite home, probably you were born in a Christian home, you had all the right doctrine, you had right all the right teaching, and they also question about his, you know, the background, his, the little background check. And then Jesus says, hey, nothing was wrong with him or nothing was wrong with his parents. It is because I wanted to show that God wanted to show his, his mighty work. And that's what Jesus was saying to him. And that's what Jesus is saying to you today. Nothing is wrong with you. Nothing, there is no sin with you or with your forefathers. But there is something that you need to do for your miracle to happen tonight in the name of Jesus. 
Are you with me? And the something is that are you willing to go to the pool of Siloam and wash that clay that God has put on your eyes? Mm. Amen. The moment you are willing to wash that clay that God has put into your eyes and you start washing it with the waters of the pool, you will come back saying, that means there were no eyeballs. But now it's God's spit. The earth through which Adam was made was put in and worked as a medicine. And God did a creative miracle. Can you imagine a creative miracle? Huh? The doctor spent to do a proper eye transplant. But my God creates a brand new set of eyes with perfect nerves, 20 by 20 vision, everything perfectly. And I tell you that man, even if you if you meet him in heaven, this man, right, he'll tell us that you know till 120 years he lived and he didn't wear spectacles. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Praise God. Praise the Lord. All the people who wear spectacles don't you know think you know yeah. You can happen to you. You know, God can do a laser surgery automatically and your vision is 20 by 20. I've seen people that are happening it before. I've seen people, you know, those who are blind, their eyes were open. I've seen people whose eyes were squinted and their eyes became normal. I've seen people who were blind for many years, God opened their uh, blindness. And they, they saw for the very first time in their lives. So many accounts, God opening blind eyes, right? So tonight, God can do that. But I've also seen people's vision being corrected. They have stopped wearing the spectacles because their vision was absolutely right, 20 by 20. Amen. Mm -hmm. My uncle was gone to be the Lord. He was about 88 or 90. He had no need and he could read the smallest print of the Bible. Praise the Lord. Right? So God can do that miracle for you. You don't have to probably wear a spectacle from tomorrow. Or put some contact lens and many women do that. Some colored ones, some starry looking ones. You know all of a sudden we say, Hey sister, you are looking different today. Some, you have done something to your eyes. <laughs> huh? Our sisters are very, you know, fashionable. Sometimes they change their eyes. You know, if you want to change your eyes, go to Jesus. He'll give you brand new eyes. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Don't start putting all the lenses and all hurt your eyes. <laughs> huh? They want to go to the nail shop, put some, you know, the nail was so much, they bring it maker. <laughs> and then put some starry, starry dot things around, you know, make it look beautiful. And then show like this, like this, like this. <laughs> you know, everyone should see the nails. <laughs> right? We love our women for. Praise the Lord. But let me tell you. What do the men? The men just go to the barber shop, have a haircut and come back up. <laughs> Not creative enough. <laughs> but now men are also getting very creative. They also have go to the spas and do all those things. Hmm? Praise the Lord. There's no harm in going to a spa. Don't get me wrong. Okay. But what I'm saying is we want good eyes. And if your eyes, the spiritual eyes needs to be open, you need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I promise you that God is going to do something so powerful that God is going to bless you abundantly. What God did, Jesus was replicating certain steps in the process of creation when he made Adam in the Garden of Eden. Right? Certain steps. He took the same one. Probably he made a clay with that water at that time, but he used spittle, his own spittle. Right? Because now probably the waters of this world is polluted and he had the unpolluted spittle of his own flesh and body that can make the powerful creation of miracle that can take place. And so what he did, he used a spittle that was pure and holy. The Bible says that he was blameless and holy. Until death he was holy and he died holy. Praise the Lord. And he resurrected holy. There was no sin and no guile in the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. His mouth was holy. His words were holy. His spittle was holy. Everything was holy. Hallelujah. So his spittle was also holy. And so when he touched it, and what he did, he took that clay and he did the process of the miracle. Hmm? The Bible says in the book of James 2, 10, 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Your faith is dead without works. That means God expects every Christian today that today when you have heard the gospel, you will do your part of your covenant, you will do your part of your duty that God has called you to do so that your miracle will manifest when you return. And that's the secret. He came back, he did not go away. This man came back to Jesus, right? And there's something very powerful here. All these men came back to Jesus. Some became evangelists, some became disciples, some were propagating the gospel and all of them came back to Jesus. It's a secret for you to maintain your relationship and maintain your miracle and maintain your blessing, your healing when you come back to Jesus. Because it is in His power for you to maintain. It is His power that helps you to maintain all that God has given you by His grace and by His mercy. 
So the Bible says, 